Okay. Oops, we don't want that. There we go. <coughs> so, welcome back to a new room and a new chapter. Hmm. So, uh, this afternoon, we're going to change pace a bit and uh, to, to help overcome the uh, rumblings of your stomach and prevent all the blood rushing there and speak it out of your head, we're going to. Um, we have some interactive exercises. And these interactive exercises <coughs> will involve, for the first time, building up models from scratch, complex systems models. In my uh, boot camps uh, back home, we do six day boot camps. <coughs> Kurt's a prime feature in the, where we build up a dozen to two dozen models sort of in, in the course of the boot camp. Um, and we don't have the luxury of doing that today, but we will be able to, to build one or two models um, together, be able to take advantage of the fact that system dynamics um, is both visual and sort of more accessible in terms of um, putting a model together. And I do that not because I expect you're going to be modelers coming out of this, but far from it, I, I do uh, instead want you to sort of understand what's involved in the modeling process. So if you work with a modeler, or if you, you're thinking about like, uh, a little bit more about what it would take to become a modeler later, you have some flavor of what's involved. How do you build these things up? What are the tools like to work with, et cetera? Okay. Um, so um, within this context, we're going to be concentrating on <clears throat> this phase that I've turned model formulation here. Um, this is following going through the model conceptualization stage where we're setting the boundary of the model, determining what's endogenous, exogenous, ignored, um, trying to identify model time horizons, key, key variables, trying to bring in any reference to patterns we're trying to explain by a model. This is a, a common theme in system dynamics where they're called reference modes, patterns over time, or in agent-based modeling where they're more broadly termed patterns because they could be patterns over time, over space, over topology. <coughs> it's also following a phase of qualitative problem mapping where we were dealing with uh, causal loop diagrams. And I've included in the slides that I've provided you a variety of additional diagrams which you, you might find of interest. Um, very fruitful avenue. And there's some types of policy analysis that are even done with causal loop diagrams. I talked with you in the closing minutes of this morning's session about um, the, the use of causal loop diagrams to reason about sort of archetypical behaviors of a system. Positive feedbacks lead to divergent behavior, instability. Whereas balancing loops leads to stability, whether good or bad, um, leads to resilience. And we're going to see that in this phase. We're not, we're not leaving all that behind in the sense of none of that is relevant. It's highly relevant. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be building up quantitative model or two here for, for the afternoon, which captures some of those feedbacks in an unambiguous form. It, it makes more precise, more specific, and more textured some of the things we will have built up in a causal loop diagram to the degree that we can simulate it. So within this model specification form, we're creating a quantitatively precise model. So that includes filling in the blanks for what it needs to be, be unambiguous. And that means specifying parameter values, quant uh, quantitative causal relationships between two variables. In the last session, we, uh, we satisfied by, by having you know, links between A and B with a plus sign or a minus sign. And, and that got us a certain distance. And indeed, there's a rich literature which draws on that for some neat insights. But here we're going to be at a quantitative level saying, how does A impact B? And the models that we're going to be showing are going to have corresponding causal loop diagrams associated with them. But they'll be, they'll be more specific than that. They'll let us test the consequences of our, of our hypothesis more rigorously than would a causal loop diagram. Okay, so we're going to be filling in these causal relations, uh, decision rules, initial conditions, and doing so in a particular modeling framework. I should note 
Now, a lot of these steps are directly mappable over to the agent-based modeling area. And in agent-based modeling, there's a similar stage of model formulation. The vocabulary is different. We're going to be building things out of stocks and flows. And uh, in uh, building, building agent-based models in any logic, for example, you'd have events and you'd have state charts and you'd have mechanisms that, that uh, connect agents to each other or that place agents within a space. Um, here within system dynamics, we're dealing with stocks and flows. So we're going to be building those up um, uh, today in the next, uh, next hour or two. Um, and then we'll look, take a look at some later phases of this as well. Okay, so let's talk about model formulation. Um, we're here, we're providing this unambiguous specification in terms of uh, a variety of, of components. And as I say, in agent-based modeling, we have a large modeling vocabulary, comparatively larger. Um, and uh, stock and flow models and, and uh, system dynamics models, rather than practicing the sort of fox knowledge, we're practicing hedgehog knowledge, as the Russian proverb lays out. So here we're practicing, we're using a few mechanisms in really, really clever ways. Okay, uh, sort of power laws in combination of a few elements in, in a creative fashion. Um, now, because you folks have seen Asian-based modeling before, <clears throat> I thought Ross did a fantastic job with that yesterday, um, and because this is a course that helps identify sort of um, uh, the, the breadth of, of many system science techniques and helps us reflect on their relationship to another, while well, I'm going to defer discussion of trade-offs till, till tomorrow, we're going to be talking about um, in ways that can be combined. I did want to highlight the contrasting structure of these two types of modeling. So within Asia-based modeling, we have a fundamental organizing principle organized around the, the agent, the actors. Maybe these agents are people. Maybe they're community representations of community organizations. Maybe they're they are uh, multinational corporations. Perhaps they're state and local governments. We have these agents, and each agent has, each type of agent has associated with it uh, a set of, of um, specified properties, rules, action, and it relates to its environment in, in, in certain ways with those rules and actions, moreover. So here, the information maintained for each particular person, each instance of, of that sort of agent, each person or each multinational corporation represented in the model, keeps track of its own state, its own current situation, its own properties, whether it's male or female, whether it's what age that person is, maybe as a continuous variable, maybe uh, keeps track of its location, um, its health status according to different criteria. So each, it's, the model in short is organized according to agents and each of these agents maintains its sort of characteristics, okay? Um, and uh, rules here are used in the model that are that specify actions contingent on state and the current context who's connected with you, kind of cur the current situation. Okay, so we have these rules that can fire. Let's say if I'm next to a infective individual, I may get infected. They say if I'm next to a person who's a peer educator on safe sex practices, I'll get educated about safe sex practices. Um, it says if I'm on a, in a given region of space that has toxins in it, I'll secure some exposure through to those toxins. So this is agent-based model, very powerful technique. You know, system dynamics kind of takes this and turns it on its head in, a, in an interesting way. So agent-based modeling, organize the model according to agent, 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 agent. Each agent keeps track of its state, its properties, its rules, etc. System dynamics organizes the model according to state and properties and context. So we actually have the model broken out into pieces, each of which is, say, a group of people according to their health state 
and whether they're low SES or high SES. Do you remember that, that very first model we saw? We had high SES, uh, low SES and high SES people, and each of them were distinguished further by their health state according to a natural history of infection. Susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. Do you recall that? Yeah. So here, the organization of the model is kind of at right angles to what we see with agent-based models. Here we're organizing it according to these characteristics of state property and context. And the information maintained for each of those bins, for each of that, those stocks, is simply a count. It's a count, the number of people in that category. And there are rules that are contingent on a particular health state. Those are associated with the flows, say, out of that health state. If I'm infective, I have a chance of dying per unit time, a hazard in a biostatistical sense. Um, I may, moreover, have a chance of infecting, um, of, of, of progressing in my infection. And those are, are represented by the flows out of me. And I may infect someone else, which could be associated with a, a connection of myself to, uh, to, to a transition for that person from one state to the other. So, so here we have system dynamics, organizing a model according to kind of state and properties and counting the number of people in a certain category. Agent-based model that organizes the model according to agent and maintains the state and sort of properties of the agent. Does that make sense? Oh. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see this in, in detail in, in just a minute. So here we have our system dynamics model. We divide people into susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, counting the number of people in each. Whereas in an agent-based model, we might have something like this. Each agent is either in a susceptible state, exposed state, infective state, or recovered state. I'm showing here a the, the way in any log you use a state chart to, to illustrate these states of people. In net logo, this will be captured in the code, in the, in the underlying code, but here it's shown visually. Um, and so each individual here is sort of maintaining this information. Okay, um, so what are these stocks? What are these sort of bins that I referred to that sort of we keep track of people? Well, they're accumulations. They represent so the number of people in that state over time <clears throat> could be people. System dynamics is great for representing continuous quantities as well. Maybe it's water in some reservoirs. Maybe it's doses of vaccine that are available for dispensation. Perhaps it's um, the number of, of cars on the road or, or of a certain vintage that are still around. Perhaps it's a um, it's a it's an amount of funds available to uh, NGO. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what this toolbox is showing down here. Um, there we go. Um, so these stocks represent accumulations. They capture kind of the current collectively. They capture the state of the system, the current situation in the system, and these can be measured at an instant in time. You could freeze the system right now and count the number of people who are in this state or that state or that state. The number of people are susceptible, infected, exposed, recovered. Um, these starts start with an initial value and thereafter they're changed by what? By flows. The flows in and flows out. I mentioned it this morning. Um, so um, examples of stocks would be here. Sort of the prototypical example, an example that helps build intuition on the part of many a student, by many a professor, is um, with respect to water in a bathtub or reservoir. There can be more of it or less of it. Um, that's a stock. Um, there may be people of different categories according to their health state, susceptible, infective, immune people. Women who are pregnant. We saw this in the gestational diabetes example I gave on Monday. Women between a certain age, high-risk individuals of certain sorts, number of healthcare workers. We'll see this in some of our examples. Amount of medicine currently in stock, and in other areas, um, more biomedically, blood sugar level, um, the amount of stored energy, my my current level of glycogen in the body, my level of T cell um, activated T cells of a certain sort to fight um, a pathogen within my body. 
It could be beds in an emergency room, could be um, the number of um, a number of diagnostic rooms that are currently free for imaging in a hospital or stockpile vaccines. These are all examples of stocks. They're an accumulation in the sense that over time it builds up or it decays, and um, there are processes by which it builds up to decay, so it'll be described with flows. Okay? Um, so here's a model and here are the stocks. Now, it's very important to realize that <clears throat> while the examples I've shown you have shown stocks typically dividing up the population. Th we also will have stocks typically that are quite different. Um, in contrast, say, to a Markov model. I don't know if any of you have done Markov model. No? no? Okay. Um, uh, where we sort of characterize the population alone in its states. Here we might have susceptible infectious and temporarily immune people, but we might also have cumulative illness or maybe cumulative costs being maintained quality adjusted life years lived by the population. We might have um, information associated with the number of deaths that have occurred over time. So stocks are not necessarily mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive in describing the population, but they are rather, they characterize current, the current state of things and sometimes we put them in to kind of keep track of quantities that we're interested in for output, say as the number of cumulative illnesses. Okay, um, so those are stocks, and stocks are very important in models because they determine the current state, the current situation of the system. And often we make this, we make choices based on levels of stocks. So we make decisions about admission to our ward based on the number of beds that are occupied in our ward. If there's no beds free, we don't admit someone from the ER. Um, or we decide about um, whether to to, in, to initiate an outbreak response uh, outbreak response immunization campaign because of the level of of reports of, of individuals who are currently infected um, in in the, in hospitalized. So stocks sort of are often the easiest thing to sort of find out about in a population. The number of people in the beds, the number of people currently being treated for X or what have you. Um, and stocks, it turns out, are central to the dynamics we see, to, to disequilibria, the situation where we build up and decay. It's not an equilibrium. Over time, it's changing. And they lead to sort of inertia in the system. We'll, we'll see this in parsing some of the results we see. But stocks lead to kind of continued change even after some of the, the things that made it possible to initiate are gone. And they give rise to delays. It takes time, for example, once we've had an outbreak and we have people in the hospital being treated, it takes time for that number to die down. They have to complete treatment. Okay. If, if we have a number of people who are obese in the population, a large number of people obese, even if we institute great physical fitness programs to help reduce uh, incidence of obesity in the population, it'll take some time before the stock, the collection of people who are obese sort of um, uh, becomes much smaller. Okay, um, let's talk now about the flip side of stocks, which are flows, the flip kind of the dual to stocks. These are flows. All changes to stocks occurred via flows. We specified for a stock the current value, or the, the starting value of the stock, the initial value. And from then on, its evolution is dictated via the flows in and the flows out. We only specify the initial value, thereafter it evolves according to the flows. And flows, in contrast to stocks, are where the action's at, in the sense that they're the things driving change in the system. Stocks represent the current state of the system. Flows represent the things changing the state of the system. Flows are expressed as something per unit time, people per unit time. And these are typically measured over some period of time. Measure them up. If you want to figure out how quickly the, um, a river is flowing, figure out how many meters per second would flow into sort of a bag you put there. 
you want to figure out how much water is coming out of a hand pump that you've driven in, you pump up, pump the water until you fill up a, um, a gallon container, say, and figure out how long it took to accumulate that, and you can say how many gallons per minute were coming out of it. Okay, so here we often measure them over a period of time, and a classic example of this is incidence, the incident rate, sort of the, the rate of incidence in terms of um, um, count of people per unit time, say per week, that are developing some, some illness. Maybe it's, um, it's uh, incidence, incidence case count for uh, influenza at this time of the year. It's a certain number of people per week or per day or per month. And these flows are going to be dictating the evolution uh, of these stocks. So let's talk about some flows. The inflow or outflow rate of a bathtub, say in, oh, that's a south of order, so I have to say gallons per minute, say. Um, rate of incident case of people per month diagnosed with X. Rate of recovery. How many people cover per, per amount of, of, of time uh, from, from this disease and say leaving the hospital? Uh, rate of mortality, number of people per year who, who, have, um, who have died, as you might get vital statistics. Rate of birth, number of babies per year. Rate of treatment, number of people per day. These are all examples of flows. These are flows. Something per unit time, and they're going to be impacting the stocks to which they're connected. Mortality is flowing out of some stock, say people with some illness. There's, and when we think about other aspects of, of life, we can also identify flows all around, um, amount of revenue a company has. If I say my company has $200 million in revenue, there's an implied unit there, $200 million per, say, year. If I say my salary is such and such, is $2,000, it'd be $2,000 per month. If I say I have, um, in Saskatoon, we have 2,000 babies, a rate of birth of 2,000 babies, you'd have to ask, well, babies per year or per month or, or what? Um, so flows are very common in our experience, and they're indicated as a rate. Uh, amount per unit time. Are people comfortable with that, that notion? Yeah? Okay, um, so here we have some flows going on. New infections. People are becoming infected. This is the action. People are getting infected. And they're going from susceptible to infected. Infected state, infectious state. People are recovering from infectious to temporarily immune. People are, are losing immunity through newly susceptible. Okay? Um, those are our flows. Um, now, there's this duality between the two. Stocks, the current value of, well, I, I said flows dictate change in stocks. If you have a bathtub, what dictates how the water in that bathtub evolves in the short term is the amount of water coming in and the amount of water going out. If the plug, if it's plugged so no water is flowing out, but water is flowing in, it will rise. If it's the water's turned off and you unplug it, it'll be going down because the water water is going going out of it. So flows dictate change in stocks. But the less obvious thing, but the thing that has profound implications is that the values of the stocks, the current state of the system, ladies and gentlemen, determines the flows, the value of the flows, the rate of those flows. So if there's Many people who are susceptible, you may have a significantly high rate of, of new cases of, of an illness that are bringing them to, uh, say, uh, some, some um, newfound uh, incidents to, to some illness. If there's nobody susceptible, there may be no one getting, getting, uh, developing this illness, contracting it. Okay, so we're going to be talking about stocks and flows, but there is an additional type of variable called auxiliary variable. And these are just convenience names for formulas that involve stocks and flows. But they're critical for model transparency. We'll be building them up. There'll be things like the total population size or the fraction of the population 
the fractional prevalence, the fraction of the population that is is uh, is, uh, is ill, for example, or the um, might be something to do with the force of infection. These are quantities that we can define using variables in terms of stocks and flows or other auxiliary variables, which are in turn defined ultimately in stocks and flows. And we give them nice names. But, but fundamentally, what it's all about is stocks and flows. Okay? So we're going to uh, take a look. But here are some auxiliary variables. Prevalence of infection, total population, um, some mean number of infectious contacts per susceptible per year. These are, these are just formulas in the model. Okay. So they yes. impact the model. Oh, they impact the model, but they are reducible to, in other words, um, we, could, we could do without them and just use the formula directly. It's kind of a convenience name for a formula that computes some quantity. But if, if we had no way to do this, we could still create models, no problem. It would just be messier because these are meaningful names, like the total population. It's nice to be able to just write you know, that the prevalence of infection is infectious divided by total population rather than writing, writing infectious over susceptible plus infected plus temporarily immune each mm -hmm. time. It's just nicer to call it yeah. Pre okay. prevalence of infection and call this total population. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so ultimately, they're convenient names. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to go build a model. Okay? Is that okay? Okay, okay. I don't hear any objections, and I hear some enthusiasm in the back from our gentleman from the Bronx. Um, that's the Bronx corner there. Um, it, th that's Hunt's Point over there. Um, <laughs> better watch out. Um, okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, let's fire up any logic again. And let's give, um, let's give more than our stomachs a workout here. Um, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close out this model here, okay? And um, I am going to ask you to, first of all, start, start your any logic up so that um, you, if you have any models closed, I'd like you to close them if it's already open do file close all so that they're all closed out, okay? Um, and uh, I'd ask you to, to get it so that your situation looks so also you have no, no projects over here, okay? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, Okay, Kurt, do you want to stand up so you can confer Krugerian help? Yeah, okay. So Kurt stands ready for deployment here. Um, who needs help right now getting, getting this up? Everyone have any logic up? Yeah? Re ready to go? Okay. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like you to n go now create a new model. Anyone remember how do I create a, well, no, we, I guess we haven't. We've, we've, we've seen it only briefly. So file, new, model. And I'd like you to say, um, uh, say, uh, S-I-R-S lock-in, okay? We're gonna be exhibiting some path dependence and lock-in effects. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, um, UMGSS, just so I can remember where this came from. SIRS lock in UMGSS. And um, you'll notice there's further a thing that says model time units. I'd like you to s change that, ladies and gentlemen, to days. Okay? We're going to be using a time unit of days. We could change it elsewhere, but it's just easier to do it here. Okay. Um, who needs Kurt? If so, just send him a text message. <laughs> okay, um, I'll take your word for it, young man. Um, okay, so are we ready to go? Okay, um, so we just created a new model. And, and this model has two basic pieces on it. Um, let's go over to, to projects here. One is, is uh, main, um, which is this canvas on which we'll build uh, this entire model for this case. 
and one is this uh, experiment. Remember those experiments? We used it to run what if questions. Does anyone remember that from this morning? Okay, good, good. Lunch was long, but it wasn't that long. Okay, great. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to now work with you to help illustrate some of these concepts we've just been talking about with, um, with uh, the, um, the notion of, of stocks and flows, okay? So, um, what I'd like you to do is to first add a stock that's called susceptible. Now, to do this, we're going to need to go to this thing called pallet, which you may remember I showed you this morning. And there's many confusing things in pallet, um, many things available to you. But I'd like you to go down to the one that, that is called system dynamics. It's about halfway down on my screen. Um, and it's shown with sort of a little box um, with a uh, half-filled half st stock and a little flow sticking out to its right. OK? People OK with that? OK, so switch to that. And you should see a palette of items that are specific to, uh, or nearly specific to system dynamics. There's actually a bit of overlap. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to go click on one of them. And holding it down, I'd like you to drag it over to the canvas here, OK? So, and I'd like you to type in the name susceptible. Kurt, you're being summoned. OK, susceptible. How did I do that? First, I went here over to Palette. And I went down here to System Dynamics. And I took stock and I dragged it in, holding down the mouse button while I was doing that. OK? OK, now, um, what do we have to specify, ladies and gentlemen? for a stock. I told you there's one piece of data, one, one item that we need to give to it. Does anyone remember what it is? Quantity. Yeah, it's, it's the initial value, in fact, of that stock. And I'd like to put in an, an initial value here of, uh, of reference to my uh, fair city of uh, 200,000. Okay, um, 200,000 people will be initially in this stock. And as with Ross's models, I've sort of tuned some of these numbers to, to, to yield some, some you know, interesting results within easy exploration. So um, put in an initial value of 200,000. Okay. Now you'll notice that there's a bit of information that's not yet filled in, it's going to fill in for this, which is sort of how this changes over time as D susceptible to T. But we don't have to worry about that. We just fill in in the note. I'm filling this in in the initial value area. You note also I'm not clicking this array thing. The array thing is, is for subscripting to capture heterogeneity. We're not going to do that. It's going to be too advanced for today. Okay, so initial value there. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like you to use this little button up here. It says build model, and I'd like you to go press it. And the dictum here is build early, build often. Just it will check to see if it understands your model, what you mean by it. And it will say, I have a problem if there's a problem. It will tell you there's a problem. So if you push it, and down here it should say build completed successfully, you know you're in good shape. OK? Who needs help? Kurt stands ready. OK? OK? So there's, there's help needed over here. So Matt, do you think you might be able to give that a try? And yeah. Um, I'll, I'll come over if, uh, if required. OK. So Curtis said, uh, can you start a new model? It's, uh, it's, he doesn't have the toolbar. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Um, Kurt, view. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll, alternatively, tools preferences. I could try. Okay. So um, 
People okay with that? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let's run this model. This model is a static model. It will be singularly uninteresting in its results, but it will be a running model. I mean, after all, it's doing something. Okay, here's our stock of 200,000 people, and look at the days pass by. Okay, um, not much is going on, but note, and, and this is going to be a point of note. I want you to to uh, keep track of this because we're going to enjoy recourse to this later. You notice as I run that, I can use this, I can click on the stock, it will show me its value, but I can also click on this little pen item here. Do you see that? If you click on that, now we could change the value of a stock. I'm going to change it to 100,000. And now we've changed it, we've updated the value of the stock. So we do have recourse to to sort of modifying values um, in a in a peremptory fashion if we wish to okay and we're going to exercise that later we're going to use that to change things yeah question no it doesn't change the default it just changes it for this particular run from now on it's going to be well in this case it's going to be a hundred thousand but it would actually change its value in the midst of a process to suddenly update it to be 100,000. We'd have, we can do that and we will do that. Yeah, okay? Okay, so that was our first model. And uh, I'd like everyone to pat themselves on their back. They've created their first simulation model, but it's a static simulation model. So um, uh, pat yourself with one hand, just, yeah. Um, the second hand will come soon enough. Um, okay, um, by the end of the day, you may need your feet as well. Um, okay, so, um, Ladies and gentlemen, um, we're off to a good start. I'd like now to create a flow out of this model. And we're going to be building this up in pieces, ladies and gentlemen, towards a model that will be rich and interesting and yield some insights from a complex systems perspective. But we're going to be doing it in a way that further illustrates, gives you a gut feel for how these pieces work, what a stock is and a flow and how they relate to each other. And, and how they can work together to describe certain types of feedbacks, et cetera. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to um, go and, and take a flow here, and I'd like to drag it out. And the way I'm gonna drag it, when you drag it, it, it creates this arrow of, of fearsome proportion. And I'd like you to drag it so that it leaves from the stock, okay? You'll notice, you'll notice on the left-hand side here, um, there's actually a little, just above the thing, there's a little uh, white circle peeking out. Can you see that on the left side of the arrow? I'm gonna drag it atop the stock until it turns green, and that indicates a connection has been made. But sort of the stock is talking to the arrow. It knows that the arrow is going to be leaving the stock. The flow is going to be leaving the stock. Do you see that? It turned green like that. Green means go. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to let this go. Boom. Okay? And now it's going to turn this into a flow. And I'm going to say here, um, I'll, I'll just leave it, at, call it flow for now. Okay? Just because I'm going to do some things with it which are not going to be representative of its ult ultimate aim ultimate name. Okay, so uh, I'm going to call it flow, and I'm going to set it, ladies and gentlemen, to have a flow rate out of a thousand people per day. So I want a flow rate out of susceptible of a thousand people per day. So I'm going to give it, just directly specify a number here of a thousand, okay? Great. It's because I set it as my, my time unit, um, the model time unit days. Now, I actually yeah. can, for many places with any logic, I can specify explicitly at that point what's the time unit to be assumed. Um, and uh, in this case, I could do that. I could specify, you know, it's a thousand people per week or something like that. But I'm not going to do that for simplicity right now. But it's a great question. So I'm going to say flow here, okay? Now, um, ladies and gentlemen, if I were to then run this model, what would you expect to see? Every day, a thousand people 
Okay, good. And, and how would that impact the value of the stock? Does anyone want to say? If the stock is 200,000, we have 1,000 people leaving every day. What's going to be happening? It's going to be going down. And in what way is it going to be going down? In a, is it going to be dropping faster and faster and faster? Or no, it's going, to be, it's going to be doing something like this. Let's go click on that stock. And let's click, you'll notice just the left of this kind of, um, uh, this thing here, I'm going to create, a, there's a little thing that looks like a wiggly, a wiggly thing. I'm going to click that. And you'll notice it's, it's drawing out the value of the stock over time. The value, the stock is declining linearly in, val in value. That's, you're not running the model now, you're just... I'm actually running it. Yep, I'll, I'll show you why I ran it. I'll uh, go and, and I did right click on this. Whoop, hey, come on. Right click on this, run. And, and this is actually running the model here. Then I clicked here and did this. I'm just graphing it out over time. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Um, so it's declining linearly. Now there's, a, there's an issue here, ladies and gentlemen. Does anyone see the issue? Right now, um, it's summer in Saskatchewan and, and uh, <laughs> things are looking fine. Um, and, uh, and you know everything looks fine with this stock. But what's gonna happen eventually that's pretty unrealistic if we extend this? What's gonna be non-physical thing that's gonna happen? If I run this faster and faster, here, here we're having negative people. Oh my gosh. Okay, we don't want that. We only want to be around positive people. Um, okay, so, um, so, okay, um, thank you. Um, so here, ladies and gentlemen, we have a flow rate that's hard coded. It's, it's hard coded as a thousand people. That's non-physical. It's, 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 it's implausible to say that the number of people leaving susceptible is going to be indifferent to the number of people who are susceptible. After all, if there's zero people who are susceptible, how can anyone leave it? Doesn't that stand to reason? So ladies and gentlemen, let's go put in a, 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 an actual structure that's the most common structure in system dynamics models. Uh, it's kind of the next level up from stocks and flows in isolation is the structure that we see again and again and again. And it comes in two varieties, but both are basically the same at a mathematical level, and it's called a first order delay. Okay. So we're going to put in place this first order delay. And once you recognize this pattern, you'll see it again and again and again on models from all different backgrounds, regardless of whether they're created with system dynamics tools or, or what are called classic compartmental models, like the Kermack McKendrick model that uh, that Ross uh, was showing or other models they're chock-a-block full of these so let's put this in here ladies and gentlemen let's put in susceptible and we're going to rename flow to be called incidents okay incidents um it's, it's going to re reflect incidents of some illness okay and we're going to change it ladies and gentlemen from merely hard coding a thousand people per day Okay, what I'd like you to do here is the following. Okay, I'm going to ask you to go to the palette and I'm asking you to put in, to drag in what's called the dynamic variable here. Okay, and I'm going to call this the incidence rate. Okay, hmm? chance per unit time. For those who are familiar with, with biostatistics, it's a hazard rate, a sort of probability per unit time that you'll develop an illness. It's a, it's a hazard rate. Okay, um, so ladies and gentlemen, this might be probability 0.1 per day, let's say. So if I, so we're going to now create a formula for incidence, okay? And what, if, what would this formula for incidence depend on? I said earlier that non-physical things would happen if we just hard coded it to 1,000. So surely, what must this depend on to be physical? This will be zero for sure if what? If 
if there's no one susceptible. So it's got to depend on susceptible, number of susceptible people. After all, if that's zero, no one's going to be developing illness. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to further go. You're building up your first known non-trivial model here. So I'm going to further go drag in a link, and it's going to link up here susceptible and incidence. And what that link indicates is it indicates incidence depends on susceptible. It kind of clues us in, even if we don't have a model fully specified quite yet, it clues us in that this depends on the number of people that are susceptible. The rate of people developing illness depends on the number of people who are susceptible. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a diagrammatic convention, but one that's powerful and one that lets you, it, it warns you if there's some missing items. Um, are people okay with that? Do you have that? Question? Oh, Kurt? Kurt, deploy to sector two. Okay. Um, next, um, uh, I'd like to drag a link over. Oh, well, I should say, what else would incidents depend on, do you think? Ladies and gentlemen, based on the names shown, what do you think incidents might otherwise depend on besides the number that are susceptible? Yes, the incidence rate, right? Okay, so let's drag in a link from incidence rate to incidence, okay? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so now we have the two ingredients outlined. And one nice feature of a system dynamics model, ladies and gentlemen, is in terms of transparency, by looking at it, you can tell what things depend on what other things visually in a very direct way. Um, that even if you don't go into all the equations, the, all the formulas behind these things, you can, you can look at it and at a glance sort of say, okay, what things depend on what. And that's kind of nice, actually, to be able to have this high level view. Kurt, this uh, sector one. Um, so. So ladies and gentlemen, for incidents here, I'd, I'd like you, oh, by the way, for these arrows, we should be sure, make sure with these arrows that they're, they've got green on both sides. Remember, green is for go. Okay. Okay, so green is for go. Green is the color. Indeed, yes. Um, green is the color that you want to watch for. Okay? Um, so, now let's go to this flow, and we're going to set the incidence, ladies and gentlemen, to no longer be hard-coded. Instead, we're going to give a formula. And from, from whence will this formula come, ladies and gentlemen? From none other than you. You're going to tell me what formula to put in. Okay, um, so let's suppose that there's a probability per day of 10% that a given person will be, will develop, contract this illness. It's a very high risk sort of thing. And suppose there's a thousand people susceptible. On average, how many people do you think you'd expect to develop that illness in the next day. 10% chance per person, per day, 1,000 people at risk. How many people do you think would develop that illness? 1,000 people at risk, ten, each, each of them bears a 10% chance per day of developing. So how many people? 100. 1,000 times 0.1. In short, the number of susceptible times the incidence rate. Susceptible times incidence rate. Okay? Okay. Now, if we do this build, remember build early, build often. If we do a build here, make sure the doors are the right thing here. Um, uh, Build early, build often. It will tell you if it's a happy camper. And 
And we're giving this formula for this instance, susceptible times sensitive rate. Number of people at risk times the chance per unit time that each of them will develop illness. Does that make sense? Yes, question. Uh, my okay. error. Okay, no. um, okay, uh, great. Who else needs help? Kurt, I, I Kurt? I need help, I just have a question. Okay, so is good. that formula you needed to be sure that you use the same names of like if I even, I mean, case sensitive. And oh, okay, yeah. So let me show you a trick if I can. Okay? I'd like to show you a trick. Great, great point. And I probably exercised this trick without sharing it with you, which is improper. Um, so um, if I want to fill this in, I could start typing um, this, and I can actually press, okay, on your computers it will be, uh, I think, control space and it should actually start filling it in. Does it actually start to fill it in there? Yeah. yeah? yeah. It'll actually fill it and you can choose which one you want to include rather than, um, rather than doing it from memory. So that will get you all the correct case. But you're absolutely right that if I, if I like did an R, lowercase r here, it would be unhappy and it would say two errors, and it says incident rate cannot be resolved. It's looking for this guy, and it found that guy instead. And, and it's, it expresses displeasure, in short. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, make it a capital. So how did I do that, ladies and gentlemen? Just if, if you go start typing the word and you do control space, it will fill it out, and it will try to say, hey, these are what you might be meaning. Pick one of these. Did you try that? Might be worth trying. Control space is your friend. On a Mac, it's command space, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, that, that, that will be quite helpful. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we have a, a first order delay here. Uh, question? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, build early, build often, and now let's run it. What do you think will happen now? Tell, does anyone want to predict? Before it was going down linearly. What will happen now? Anyone? Okay. Oh, we didn't set the incidence rate. Oh, man. Come on. Sorry, rookie error. We need to go back. Sorry, I just stopped it. <laughs> we need to set the incidence rate. It was incidence zero. So I started running it, and I realized, oh, man, we didn't, we didn't set this. Um, so I'm going to stop this. And I'm going to go to this, and I'm going to set the incidence rate, let's say 10% per day, okay? Just, just uh, for, for ease. And, and we will now run it. So what did I do? I went here, and in this incidence rate equals, I put 0 0.10. And, and now I'm going to do run. Who needs help from Kurt or from Matt? Okay, uh, help on the far side, sector three. How many sectors are there? There, there are three. Okay, so what do you think this is going to be doing if you graph this, ladies and gentlemen? It's, it's dividing, it's, it's dropping quickly at fast and then slower later. Why is that? This is the number of people susceptible. Why is it going down quickly at first and then slower? Okay, uh, sector two. Is it because the total population is reducing as, yes. as we go along? There's fewer people at risk over time, so, so the number per day that are developing illness becomes smaller. Okay? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a first-order delay. We, we call it a first-order delay because the inflow is actually a delayed version of the outflow. In this case, there's no inflow. But you may recall from this morning, I don't know if you remember my slide, but I said not long before we broke, I said that each of these, these uh, types of feedbacks has a, has a characteristic type of, of uh, shape. And this is the sort of shape we see. It's just coming down from the top rather than going up. It goes fast initially and then slowly approaches something. This time it's flipped over. It's coming down from the top. That's associated with a negative feedback. So ladies and gentlemen, where would the negative feedback be here? Why do I say there's a negative feedback here? Anyone? 
Why do I say there's a negative feedback? Well, because there's less people coming out of the festival. Oh. Yes, exactly. So, so the more susceptible, let's let's try to fill in these gaps. There's actually one link here and one link here. Okay. Does this link here from susceptible to incidence, is that associated with a plus or a minus polarity? If we increase susceptible, all of the things being equal, that will that tend to increase incidence or lower it? Increase, so it's a plus. If I increase incidence, all of the things being equal, will susceptible go up or down? It, if, it will go down. If I increase incidence, people will leave faster. So there's a negative feedback here that's associated with this classic behavior of a negative feedback, this kind of convergent behavior. See this? See this graph? You see that? Yeah. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to challenge you to do something now. I'd like you to do something you did before, but I'd like to give it special significance. I'd like you to click on this, this, well, if you haven't already, and then I'd like you to put this pen, and I'd like to give this a value of 100, okay? And now it will, oh, we have to, do we have to close it? Okay, I have to, I guess I have to close it again and display it. You'll notice that it, now it, it perturbed and now it's coming back down again. So I can set this to different values. I'm gonna set it to, to 500 now. And I'll again push this, I, I have to push this graph. And you notice I'm, I'm pushing it, and it's pulling back. It's pushing back against me, as befits a negative feedback. I perturb it, I disturb it, and it pushes back against it. it you know, I make it higher, it loses value faster. I make it higher yet, it loses value faster. So this is a system which is, seeks to be in balance, and the point at which it's in balance is no one's susceptible. So it's kind of going back to that. And I could keep on disturbing it, and it will resist. It'll be resilient in its, its efforts. I could set it back to 1,000, put it back to this graph, and it will be coming back down. Do you see that? People OK with that? So are you kind of running little mini experiments within? Yeah, I'm running mini ex a Great question. This is actually sort of a dynamic experiment. I'm sort of playing with it interactively here. Because you're temporarily changing the value? I'm temporarily changing the value. And we're going to get to the point where we don't have to do that anymore, but for learning the first few steps, it's, a, it's an easy thing to do. Yeah. We're going to start to put in graphs, which will actually be much nicer than this, and sliders, and we don't have to, we don't have to do this all the time. It's just it's an easy way to do things at first. Okay. Are, are, people, are people willing to go forward? Okay, because we're going to do something really, well, okay, at least I think it's exciting. Um, okay, um, okay, we're going we're gonna to do something that, that I think is exciting, and I hope Kurt thinks it's exciting, too. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, that's, that's relief, Kurt. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we've just, um, you know, examined and worked with this classic first order delay, the situation where we have a fixed rate here. It could be expressed alternatively as a fixed time, and in which case, if there's an average time in the stock, we divide by it. We'd, we'd, we'd be dividing by that average time. Um, alternatively, we could phrase it as times an incident whose value is one over the average time. Either, either way works, and there's some mathematical reasons for it that I'd be happy to explain to people offline. But the point is, this first order delay, you can specify it either with an average time in the stock and divide by it here. It would be susceptible divided by average time in the stock, or you can multiply by some rate of leaving the stock. Um, OK, so this is good. But ladies and gentlemen, we have larger fish to fry. So we're going to drag in no less than a second stock, OK? And this second stock is going to be called, and I've got to check my, my master plan here. It's called um, Infective. 
infective. Okay? Infective. Mm. Okay. So this is the stock of infectives. Um, by the way, what did I just do there? I just whipped this around. I, if you grab onto this thing, you can kind of move the location of the label so that they are in aesthetically pleasing positions. So you I, have to make sure you select the object first. You, you have to select it. Yeah, you can't just directly click on those things. You have to select the object with which those things are associated, and then you can move them and, uh, per your pleasure. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just added an infective stock, and I'm going to give it an initial value of zero. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are piece by piece building up a model and hopefully building up your understanding as well. So, per the latter, I'd like you to tell me what do you think will happen if I run this model now? What do you think we'll see in Susceptible? It'll keep decreasing just the same way. Great, great, great. Okay, how about infective? What will be going on there? What do you think will be happening here? Increasing in what way? The, the linear speed? Just up at, a, at, a, at, a, at the same speed? No, it'll be going up like that. Why is it going up faster rather than... Yeah. Initially it was zero, and of course this guy is decreasing faster at first, and all of those people are going over to here, right? All the people leaving this are coming over here. So this is decrease, increasing faster, this is decreasing faster. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, stocks and flows. Let me highlight to you again an important point here. The value of the stocks over time evolves according to the flows. So this stock, we, we specified an initial value of zero, and after that, its evolution is dictated by the flow. This stock, we specified an initial value of 200,000. After that, its value is dictated by the flow. Where did the value of the flow come from at any given time? What's the value of the flow? Well, it's, it is dependent on the value of the stocks. That's right. So the value of this flow is dictated, in this case, by susceptible time sets. So the flows, their current value, specifying how it's changing right now is dependent on the current state of the system. And that state evolves according to those flows in these models. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the evolution of the state of the system is dictated by the flux. Okay, so this is, this is um, what I would call nifty. Um, let's, um, let's not uh, rest on our laurels. So. Okay, so we're going to add, ladies and gentlemen, um, one more stock, and then we're going to start to do some, some extra nifty stuff. So I'd like to drag in a stock, which will be called... recovered and immune and immune now I, I have an apology to make um, and my apology is is uh, is because I stand before you as a computer scientist and I apologize as a on behalf of my fellow computer scientists for burdening you in unnecessary ways in your lives um, Yes, and I'm not talking about uh, your iPhone reboots occasionally or something like that. I'm talking about how I need to actually, I can't put a space in here, okay? Um, we, we have a straight jacket in which we live in computer science. We, we can't put in spaces, so, so we're going to have to say recovered, and then I put a capitalized and, and then a capitalized I. Or you can put under bars. That's another acceptable thing, but not dashes. Oh, the world is complicated, I know. Um, but but recovered and immune, I prefer to put it in what's, what we call a, a camel case um, because it looks like the humps of a camel. Up and down, up and down. <laughs> I kid you not, that's what it's called. Um, oh, believe me, you wouldn't believe what all the things we have to live with. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to drag out a flow going from infective to recovered and immune. Okay? Um, Okay, um, and how did I do that? Let me, let me do that again, because I know I, I went too quick there. What did, what did I do? Let's, let's rehearse this, this whole thing again. Um, I, um, I first dragged out a stock, 
and I called it in a camel case fashion, I called it recovered and immune. Capitalize the beginning of each word so you can kind of visually notice when words begin and end. And then what I did is I dragged out a flow here. Now, as it turns out, I didn't position these artfully. And so my flow kind of did not stretch neatly between them. And so then I had to kind of do a bit of fix up by dragging it over there. And then it sort of meshed okay. And now it's hunky dory, as you could see from the, from the green. Look, if, if young people are allowed to have um, all sorts of fancy new dictum, allow us old people to have some fun too. <laughs> <laughs> some of us in this room could probably remember Hunky Dory um, from before when you were born. Um, okay, so anyway, this flow, um, this flow here is going to be called uh, recovery. And I'm going to give it a, a lowercase uh, recovery here. And what I'm going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to put in place the other form of a first order delay. I'm going to drag in a parameter this time that's going to be called here. Um, oops, it's going to be called uh, mean time. Okay, let me get that. Whoa. Um, yes, it's going to be called. Um, it's going to be called recovery delay. Okay. Actually, I'm sorry. It's oh gosh, I, I I screwed up. It's not a parameter. It's actually a dynamic variable. I, I apologies. I was I was asleep at the switch there. So are parameters always static? Um, actually, they don't have to be static. It's just it's a good practice to keep them static because they're typically encoding assumptions which vary little. And this in this case, it's going to be a center point of our work, and it's actually going to be varying the recovery delay. So in this case. For conceptual reasons, I wanted it to be um, to be uh, appropriately dynamic, um, and it it will be helpful that it is. Okay, so this is going to be called recovery delay, and maybe I'll do that with a lowercase r, um, just hewing to convention of just keeping the these things capitalized, the stocks capitalized. Okay, um, okay, so. Um, recovery delay here, I'm going to, well, you tell me. Surely, ladies and gentlemen, the number of people recovering per unit time needs to depend on something. On what do I, ref to what do I refer? What do you think it needs to depend on? Under what situation are we confident there's nobody recovering if there are no, yeah, and no infectives? Good, so we have a, we have a thing there, a link between those. Notice green is the color. And then we'll drag here to recovery delay and down to recovery, okay? And um, it's also gonna depend on recovery delay, okay? And I am going to specify this alternative form of a first order delay here, which is going to be infective divided by recovery delay. This is going to be, the recovery delay is representative of kind of the mean recovery time of a person. You notice that we're here, um, and this is, this is why people will legitimately um, criticize system dynamics or aggregate modeling more, more accurately for sometimes imposing assumptions about homogeneity. We're, we're kind of abstracting away from the vagaries of, of Maybe some people are faster recovery, some people are less. If we wanted to capture that, we could do so in a, in a way that would be initially adequate, but it would get uncomfortable if we started to do too much of it, which is um, stratifying the model, having you know, a, a model for people uh, of different ages or different immune, immunocompromised levels of immuno, immuno strength. Um, we could have different recovery delays. But, but um, if you really want a highly heterogeneous population, um, you know, individual-based modeling is, is, is going to be something you're, you're going to want to think about. Right now, we're, 
we're comfortable sort of learning learning this in the context of assuming a simple recovery delay. And this is great for quick experimentation with a model. So recovery delay is going to be there. And for recovery, we're going to have number infective divided by recovery delay. So the more infective people there are, the more people, the faster people will be going down recovery. More people per day will be recovering. And the longer the recovery delay is, the fewer people per day will be recovering. If we have a very fast recovery delay, then there's going to be a lot of people going very quickly for recovery. Does that make sense? Okay. And there's a mathematical reason, a rigorous mathematical reason behind this if you assume that people's time within a given stock is exponentially distributed, in other words, a memoryless process, there's, there's, there's a clear mathematical reason rooted in stochastic, um, stochastic processes that you'd, you'd make this assumption of this divided by recovery delay. Okay? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, now I'd like to go display these, these three uh, stocks. What do you think you'd expect to see now if you were to run this? Oh, yeah. Oh, recovery day. We well, have to give it a value. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That was that, okay. Thank you for keeping me honest. Okay. For recovery delay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to um, give it an initial value of 10. 10 days. Okay. You notice it says down here time days, and we're going to be giving it a value of 10. It's, it's down here time days. Yeah, it's, it's saving for auto recovery. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I, I just knocked this. Whoa. I don't know how it got down there. Sorry? Uh, oh, for infective, it's initially zero. And recovered and immune is going to be initially zero, too. Okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, let's run this thing. What do you think you'll see? What do you think will happen? So, so what do you think susceptible will be doing? Same thing as before. Ain't nothing changed there. How about infective? Well, how about recovered? What do you think that will be doing? Going up or down? Yeah, ain't nowhere to go but up. There's flow in, no flow out, right? Okay. How about infective? Ah, the plot thickens. What do you think that's going to be? How is that going to be changing? It's kind of staying within a fairly small range. Okay, right now I have it going up and then down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what's going on there? Help, help me understand this, ladies and gentlemen. And this is going to point us to an important dynamic that we're going to be exploiting to give, to lend explanation to some patterns that we see um, that might otherwise be uh, confusing. So. Ladies and gentlemen, why do you think it's going up initially? Under what conditions would a stock rise if what? Well, uh, let me ask this. Under what conditions, conversely, would it, would it fall? Well, it turns out that it will rise, ladies and gentlemen. Suppose you were dealing with your bathtub. Mm -hmm. You have the water on and, and the, the plug is unplugged. Under what conditions would the water be rising if what was greater than what? The, the inflow is greater than the outflow, the rate of inflow. So maybe you're getting, um, you know, two gallons a minute coming in and one gallon a minute going out, and so it'll be rising. Will it not? It will. Okay. So this stock is rising as long as what is greater than what? Yeah, as incidence is greater than recovery. There's more people coming in per week from incidence than there are leaving through recovery, right? It'll be rising. And it'll be falling conversely if the number of recovered is greater than incident. So so let's let's think about this. Why would it be rising? Why would the number getting of incidents be greater than recovery initially? Remember what the initial value of this was? Zero. Zero. So why would it be that this is greater than that initially? Well yeah, because there's there's no one in here originally, so there ain't no one to recover initially, right? But there's certainly people coming in here through incidents, and so it's going to be rising. Now, eventually, 
there's enough people in here that the number of people recovering is going to be greater than incidence. What do you think is going on just when this is flat, just at the peak of this? What do you think is happening there? Okay. This guy has to equal that guy. Equal that guy. The, the rate of incidence is the same as rate of recovery. It, it flattens out. Now, it turns out this will be a quite helpful insight for certain types of models. And we may look at one in just a few minutes where that will be quite useful to, to be able to reason about this. So at this peak point, it isn't that that's the time of the fastest incidence. Far from it. That's the time when incidence equals recovery. Let's go see what incidence is doing at that time. Well, you can tell me. What do you think incidence is doing at that time here, time 10? Do you think it's at its maximum? When is incidence at its maximum? At the beginning. The very beginning. So incidence is at its maximum early, but the number of infective is at their maximum at time 10 because there's a delay. I heard it earlier. There's a delay. There's a delay in terms of you know, there's some time people are spending this infective state of batching people up. More and more people are coming in, and not all of them have left. And this is the time when it's maximum. Beyond this, the number of people coming in due to incidence is lower. Why would it be lower eventually? Because there's fewer susceptibles anymore. And, and the number recovered is greater than the number uh, for incidence. So now it's declining. So, the number of infective is actually highest here at time 10, even though the incidence is highest at the very beginning time. Note that. Note that, note that, note that. Because this is one of the classic mistakes people make between a stock and a flow. You might think that the stock, the value of the stock, is going to be highest when the flow into it is the largest. That's not the case. It depends also on the flow out. And it depends depends on sort of the cumulative values of these flows and how long you spend in that stock. So this stock is actually highest when a time where the incidence rate, I mean, let's go look at this incidence here. Let's, let's graph that out. And what you can see is if we line it up, you know, that's at, at time 10, when, when that rate is, is highest in the, in the number of infective, incidence is way down. You see that? But... There's a delay there. It's, 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 it's accumulating. That number infective is accumulating all these people coming over. They haven't recovered yet. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's a little bit of a caution that it's very easy. And even extraordinarily smart people can do this in controlled conditions. They found that people rush to conclusions. If this is the highest, that's the highest danger. No, it's actually the number of infectives can be quite a bit higher after the, the max incidence time. The prevalence can be higher after, long after the max incidence has declined, has, 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 has passed. Stock and flow, there are these delays. Delays are associated with stocks. Stocks accumulate, okay? And here we have a, a decreasing incidence over time but the, the uh, prevalence actually reaches its maximum. This is a disequilibrium phenomenon. Those of you, I think probably everyone in here has taken uh, epidemiology and you know in an equilibrium, the prevalence equals the incidence times the duration, but this is a disequilibrium. This ain't equilibrium, folks. This is a, this is a rapidly changing situation. So we get these delays. Okay, but let's, let's explore this more. Um, Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let's now put in some more mechanism that will make this a full-blown model worthy of your attention and your, your taking away from this room. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you now to, to first, um, let's put in some convenience mechanisms, okay? Um, what I'd actually like to do is to go put in a mechanism for displaying over time the number of susceptible infected recovered so we don't have to use those dinky little graphs where we click on things okay so let's go to our palette so we're going to go back to our palette and I'd like to go down to this area it says analysis okay 
And in the analysis area, you will see a time plot. I'd like you to drag in the time plot here. And I'd like you to, to drag this over. Okay, who else needs Kurt's help? Okay. Okay. Um, does anyone else need Krugerian help? Okay. So we, we dragged in the plot here. Okay. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say, give the plot, um, let's, let's just say plot um, stocks. I mean, you know, it's, it's, we're going to be plotting out the, the values of the stocks, okay? Um, okay, so these are the stocks. And what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to tell it to plot each of the stocks in turn. So once we have this, what did I do again? I went to palette. I went all the way down here to analysis, and I dragged in time plot. <laughs> and then I click on time plot here. And I'm going to, to go down, I called it plot stocks in my camel case fashion. And then I'm going to go to the data area and I'm going to say plus. And I'd like to put down for the title of the first, susceptible, okay? So th the very first item will be sus oops, susceptible, okay? That'll be the title. And its value will be given. Anyone want to guess what the value will be? Susceptible. And in fact, you could you could probably go and, and do the um, the control control space and it will fill it in. Susceptible. Okay? Build early, build often. Go put put that up there, make sure it's a, it's it's a happy camper. Okay. Okay? Is it a happy camper? Okay, um, Krugerian help in, in sector uh, sector two. Okay, um, okay, green is the color. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so that's one thing, and now let's add similar items for infective and recovered and immune. Okay. So so let's go plus. And let's go, let's go infective here, okay? So we're gonna type in, in oh, sorry, okay. Infective, and then let's do infective. And then let's do recovered and immune, okay? And fortunately in the titles, we're just telling it a title. We could use spaces um, with abandon. So, so let's um, let's let's go and, and say recovered and immune for the title. But but in the value area, we are we are uh, controlled by the by the dictates of uh, of, of the programming language, so-called Java. Okay. Okay, so after you've done each of those, I'd like you to, to, to press this and, and make sure it's a happy camper. It would say yes. And then I'd like you to scroll down. Okay, who needs more time to fill in those, those things? Okay, more, a bit more time? Okay, so uh, let's, let's rehearse what I did. If anyone's behind, I went to the palette and I dragged in a time plot. I called it plot or I called it I think plot stocks or time plot stocks plot stocks Oop, I shouldn't say sus um, plot stocks and then I went down to this area to the data area and I successively added in things I call them susceptible and I gave its value a susceptible I told it where to look for that value said hey plot this thing called infective I told it where to look for the value of infective and I did another one, I said recovered and immune call it, and I told it where to look for the value of recovered and immune. Okay, are people ready to, for a little bit more here? Who would like a bit more time? Okay, we're ready to push forward a little bit? Okay, let's go down to data update, 
and I'd like you to say where it says display up to, put in 10,000. It says 100 right now. Where is this thing? Whither does it lie? It lies down in the data update section, and, and it's, it says display up to. And the next thing I'd like you to do is in the time window here, I'd like you to say 2,500 model time units, okay? 20, for the time window, for under scale. Some of these may be collapsed, in which case you'll have to uncompress them or un expand them. Okay, so I did display up to 10,000 time window 2,500. Okay. 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 Are you folks okay? Want a bit more time? Just a little. Where was that display? Okay, that is in the what's called the data update section here. Okay. And you may it's possible you have to expand it, but if so, you have to scroll down a little bit and it'll say display up to ten thousand. You see that? Okay. Who needs Kurt's help? Okay, great. Green is for go. Okay. Okay, build early, build often. Who needs a bit more help? Who needs a bit more time? Okay. Okay. Now, the last thing I'd like to do, ladies and gentlemen, is in the simulation here, I'd like you to set it to be set it to be a time associated with it of under there be in the simulation in the experiment there'll be a model time section and i'd like you to set it to model time 2500 okay yeah and actually it'll say stop at specified time so let me see what i did again i went to simulation i i went and i scrolled down to model time, it's actually the, just the next one down, and I said stop at specified time 2500. And what now that we've done that, we'll be in fine shape from now on. Apologies for the trouble. Okay, P build early, build often, you're in fine shape. Okay, who needs help? All quiet across the sectors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's it's a good sign when people are quiet, but it does raise the disconcerting. It, it means it has two very different interpretations, <laughs> like like Ross's model yesterday. Um, it it has a, it's it's uh, non-unique in terms of its implications of the underlying process. Um, the <laughs> process could be positive. You folks are feeling good, making progress. Um, feeling mastery, or you could be feeling beyond hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, that's, that sounds good. Oh, Ross, thanks. Um, okay, we'll, 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 run, we'll run her now, and then we'll come back for the coup de grace. Okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> be sure to come back. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, so let's, let's, let's run. <laughs> run it here that's right um so ladies and gentlemen if you run this out you should see something like that right um so uh it ran out to time 2500 and here you have these two things now it's going to get a lot more interesting in a bit but um but uh right now you see all the dynamics going on at the beginning time here okay um so that's that's good we have um we have this graph, graphing things. If we wanted to, we could have told it to go to 500 instead. And for our current purposes, that would have been fine. But we're about to go where no person has gone before in the coup de grace. So, uh, so let's, um, let's leave open room for expansion. OK, um, I, I think the idea of a, of a washroom break is a good one. Um, so so let's, let's break uh, for um, 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay, great.
see you back soon. I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah.